You certainly can't say Fox didn't go all out in promoting this series. The studio rented out several movie theaters to showcase the pilot episode, and it was watched by 17 million viewers in its first week. And I think it's safe to say that many of the viewers weren't ready for what they were about to get. You like to watch my body? The show's seven influence is apparent right away as we join Seattle in mid-downpour. And it's no surprise, since Chris Carter loved that film so much that he hired production designer Gary Wisner to recreate it for this episode. You know, what, you know, what, what is this show exactly? What do you conceive it to be? And as he does, he goes um, kind of cryptically, he goes, um, Seven. I, I, I like the movie Seven. We're introduced to a bevy of beautiful blonde dancers in the skeeviest dungeon of a strip club you'll see. Unless, you know, you're a strip club connoisseur. One of the women, who goes by the stage name Calamity, misses her chance to go home because a regular known only as The Frenchman offers her $200 for a 10 minute dance. Unbeknownst to her, the creepy Frenchman is fantasizing about her dancing in blood and fire. This was quite the opener in terms of content, pushing the boundaries of skin and blood on network television. And I'm sure the music budget probably took a hit too, with White Zombie's Astro Creep and Nine Inch Nails Piggy both getting featured prominently. From there, we're introduced to Frank Black, played by Lance Henriksen, his wife Catherine, played by multi-show veteran Megan Gallagher, and their daughter Jordan, played by newcomer Brittany Tiplety. Frank's family just arrived in Seattle to settle down in their bright yellow house. More on that in a minute. The family seems happy, and the neighbors are friendly. Of course, the neighbor will set off the spidey sense of every Chris Carter viewer thanks to the paranoia he fosters. Frank sees an article about Calamity's murder and immediately offers his services to Seattle PD and old friend Bob Bletcher, played by frequent Michael Mann collaborator Bill Smitrovich. Frank, it turns out, is something of a legend in Seattle, having worked homicide before joining the FBI. Carter and his team make sure to touch on all the serial killer greatest hits, as they note that Frank once caught a cannibal. You got a guy that caught the guy. A serial murderer who ate his victims. I was always curious, how'd he prepare them? In a skillet, with potatoes and onions. Frank asks to be taken to the woman's body, where he figures out much of the details and method while she remains in the body bag, sparing the audience and censors from seeing the carnage. This serves as the premise of the show, with Frank having what amounts to psychic flashes from the crimes. Frank explains that it's not psychic powers. Like Will Graham and Manhunter, he's just able to put himself in the killer's shoes and think how he thinks. The show doesn't have a perfect film language to differentiate between that and psychic powers though, so it just looks like psychic powers. Just know that Frank's abilities are not supernatural in origin, but they do seem to be natural in the sense that he didn't learn them or develop them as a result of trauma. When asked, Frank simply explains, Lucky guesser. On a hunch, Frank goes to the ruby tip to interview Calamity's friend Tuesday, and she tells him about the Frenchman. Meanwhile, the Frenchman cruises the park for another victim, this time a gay male. Because the victim was a man, the police don't think that they're related. But Frank, of course, realizes that they are. Because Frank. Frank arrives home to find his contact with the Millennium Group, Peter Watts, played by Lost Terry O'Quinn. Watts tells Frank that there was a needle puncture wound that was missed in the initial autopsy, but they can't find anything that was administered in the toxicology reports. He also says Frank has the group's full support. At home, Catherine implores Frank not to shut her out. It turns out Frank hasn't really shared with her what his job is, and it also turns out that she's not stupid. Frank returns to the scene of the crime where he spots the Frenchman and gives chase, but the Frenchman eludes him by hanging off a bridge. Finally, we hit the requisite peak of all Hunt for a Serial Killer movies, where the cops gather around and play abnormal psychology. Frank tells them that the killer is gay, but he feels guilty over his sexuality and tries to force himself to be straight by going to peep shows. He also happens to be heavy into apocalyptic lore like Yates and Nostradamus, so the killings are his way of fulfilling prophecies he's read. The other cops think it's too far-fetched. Besides, they have the hairs from a black suspect, so they're fixated on looking for a black guy. Go figure. Frank's daughter Jordan winds up in the hospital having hit her head after passing out from the flu, 
and when Frank sees the nurse extracting a blood sample, he realizes that's where the puncture wounds came in. The killer is extracting blood, and that means he has more victims who've been buried alive. A search of the woods leads to a coffin, and indeed a man who has been buried alive. This is one of the most disturbing images of the series, as the man has his eyes and mouth sewn shut and his hands stitched to his chest. The victim's attempts at screaming make the scene all the more unsettling. <laughs> Bletcher shares that it was the most horrific thing he's ever seen in 18 years as a cop, so Frank shares the story of the case that drove him into retirement. A serial killer who would send Polaroids of his victims to the police to taunt them. After they put him away, Frank started receiving Polaroids of Catherine, which shattered the detached feeling he had toward the crimes he investigated. Frank was paralyzed with fear until the Millennium Group found him and helped him understand his gift as part of his rehabilitation. The pathologist calls and tells Frank that the blood samples they found were trafficked through inter-office mail, which leads Frank to realize that the killer works in the department's own evidence lab. Sure enough, when he goes down there, the killer recognizes Frank's abilities and begins raving about the apocalypse. He's about to do Frank in before Bob Fletcher arrives on scene to make the save. The next morning, Frank surprises Jordan with a new puppy, but the Polaroid stalker strikes again, having followed them from DC to Seattle. And we're out. This was a hell of a start to the series, showcasing the series' dour tone and envelope-pushing style. Carter's A-Show The X-Files had just hit its creative stride and transitioned from a cult hit to mainstream smash. It's easy to see, though, why fans of that show's glib protagonist Fox Mulder and his stoic partner Dana Scully had a harder time getting behind Frank Black. The X-Files had basically everything a weekly viewer could want in a drama. Mystery, twists and turns, a will-they-won't-they they between the two attractive leads. Millennium offers ponderous psychodrama, which honestly I think fits better in 2024. With our culture's tendency to cannibalize itself and recycle old pop culture for a new generation, Millennium doesn't even feel all that aged out. You'd think that a show that opens with White Zombie and Nine Inch Nails on the soundtrack before cutting to rain-slick Seattle streets couldn't be any more 90s than if the killer was played by Dan Cortez in a pair of Zubaz pants. And yet the show's premise about surviving in the face of nihilism rings more true today than it did back then. Most of the blame and credit for why Millennium is the way that it is goes to Lance Henriksen. After ratings took a downturn, Entertainment Weekly laid the blame on Henriksen for not being able to find a shred of humor or buoyancy in the character. A problem Henriksen actually brought to creator Chris Carter. If it was a movie, it would be a great movie. I mean, you wouldn't have to worry about the darkness. People can take that, you know, uh, for a period of time and then they move on. But, uh, but as a series, I, I didn't know how anybody was going to hang in with it. But the show was never intended to be another X-Files. It was a different sort of exploration, one rooted in philosophy, psychology, and sociology, and less rooted in plot. This is not to say that Millennium was just too smart for the average viewer. Far from it. It just wasn't what viewers needed at the time. And had the series bowed 10 or especially 20 years later, it probably would have found greater success. What Henriksen does bring to the role is his brand of soft masculinity. Frank Black views his role as savior and protector, but not so much that he becomes arrogant. In fact, it shows up in his nurturing, and that was Carter's answer to Henriksen on how to keep this show from becoming too downbeat. Where is the light in this? Where is the light? I don't know how this is gonna work as a series. And all Chris said to me was, the yellow house. Frank deals with the horrors of the world by trying to keep his family isolated from them and nurturing their happiness. That's why the yellow house. That's why the puppy. That's why the feeling of profound helplessness when Jordan is in the hospital. Like most heroes, Frank has a hyper-developed sense of responsibility. And that manifests in him being overly protective of his wife and daughter. The real world starts to seep in. You can't stop it. I want you to make believe that I can. One thing that this episode does extremely well is make everything feel creepy. Frank's jovial neighbor feels creepy, even though he does nothing but be friendly and inquisitive. Frank! Couldn't have picked a nicer place to come back to. Peter Watts appearing at Frank's house feels creepy, even though he's supposed to be one of the good guys. It just feels like there's danger all around, even when there isn't. 
Despite the separation of the two shows, there are some hints that this and the X-Files take place in the same universe. In the Season 2 X-Files episode, Little Green Men, Mulder listens to a recording in which one of the participants says that he saw a stripper named Tuesday at the Ruby Tip. It's not much more than a neat little tie-in, but one has to imagine that both Tuesday and Calamity would have been pretty popular. For reasons. One of the things that hasn't aged well is the killer's motivations. Killer is confused about his sexuality. He feels guilt, so he goes to peep shows to try to feel something toward women, but all he feels is anger. This is an episode that goes out of its way trying not to be homophobic, couching the killer's mental illness and the repression forced upon him, and I can see why the show thinks that that is an important distinction, but ultimately it's still gay guy equals killer. In a bit of trivia, one of the dancers is played by Fania Monday, who would play another dancer later in the season, and come back again as another character in season two. She actually made her feature debut earlier in the year in a film called Profile for Murder, in which she shares a fairly graphic love scene with Lance Henriksen. Although much will change over the course of the series, this episode, much like the pilot for The X-Files, displays a strong sense of purpose and tone, and you can't ask for much more than that from a pilot.